Okay, so today we're very happy to have uh, Shwe Dewen from uh, Harvard and uh, CU Boulder, who's going to be telling us about flow case CFTs and conformal cooling. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Bruno, for the introduction. Uh, uh, yeah, thank everyone for coming. Today, I, I'm going to introduce uh, our recent story uh, of something called the conformal cooling. Um, so this is mainly based on the recent work with uh, Rui Hua Fan, uh, who is a graduate student at Harvard uh, in Ashland Group. Um, so uh, let me start from the Uh, let me start from the outline. I will first uh, give some uh, motivation uh, for this work, and then uh, I will introduce a family of exactly solvable driven CFT uh, that have interesting uh, face diagram. And uh, then we will apply this setup to finite temperature, and we found that it can be used as uh, quantum cooling. Okay, so. The uh, introduction. Uh, first, we know that uh, in quantum many body physics, um, there can be a very rich physics when we have more and more particles. Uh, for example, if we know very well about the property of a single water molecule, it doesn't mean we can understand the, the phase diagram for a cup of water very well, right? And similarly, uh, in non equilibrium physics, so uh, even if we know uh, the phase diagram very well, it doesn't mean uh, we can understand everything uh, when the system is out of equilibrium. For example, if you put uh, your water in a disk and you heat it, uh, there can be some, some uh, very interesting patterns uh, which are called uh, uh, really Bernard convection cells. Uh, these are some, uh, uh, some non-equilibrium patterns. Okay. Uh, uh, what I mean is that when we study the uh, non-equilibrium physics, there can be something new uh, which are not existing in the equilibrium physics. Okay, so the, the motivation of this talk is to study uh, 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 something, uh, some interesting thing in, in non-equilibrium physics. Okay, although it is interesting, but we know there are many challenges uh, in non-equilibrium physics. Uh, for example, when the system is far from equilibrium, there can be a uh, lot of excitations. Okay, there can be a lot of excitations. The entanglement um, can, can be very, very, very large. So we know that when the entanglement, uh, when there is much entanglement, uh, there is no efficient numerical method. For example, in quantum many body physics, uh, for example, in one dimensional system, People use the matrix product state um, a numerical method. This method uh, works very well when the entanglement is not uh, large. For example, when there is area law entanglement, it works very well. But now, if the, if the system is far from equilibrium, the entanglement can be like a volume law uh, and so on, then the uh, numerical method doesn't, doesn't work well. So for so, so in this talk, uh, instead of studying things numerically, uh, we introduce an uh, exactly solvable setup in one dimensional uh, CFT. So we've, uh, we found something uh, interesting uh, with, with uh, the following features. First, uh, the, the, um, our setup uh, is universal, uh, which means uh, the result should be independent of the concrete models on the concrete CFTs, which should have some uh, universal feature. And we also hope it is non-trivial, which means when you drive the system, if nothing interesting happens, then, then it's not, not uh, interesting. <laughs> we, we, we hope there can be an uh, interesting face diagram. Okay, and we also hope it can be useful. Uh, for example, uh, it, uh, our setup can be used to control, um, to manip manipulate the quantum entanglement and uh, also the, the thermal entropy. Okay, I will uh, introduce uh, the details in, in the following, in the uh, following slides. Okay, uh, so the idea uh, uh, before we uh, we inter introduce the concrete setup, 
the idea is really from our daily life experience. It is from swing. So I think everyone knows how to uh, swing uh, in the playground. So in general, we need to deform our body in time, okay? And uh, roughly, there can be two different phases. Uh, uh, I call it uh, stable and unstable. Okay, unstable means when you, uh, when you do the swing, you can uh, swing higher and higher, your energy grows in time. Uh, it's not, we are absorbing energy, so it's not stable. For stable uh, phase, I mean, if we don't play very well, we simply oscillate uh, in some very small amplitude. We, we, the, the, the energy doesn't grow in time, it is stable. So how to, how to understand this feature uh, in a, a quantitative way? Uh, let's uh, consider a very simple uh, harmonic oscillator, okay? A harmonic a zero dimensional harmonic oscillator. Uh, this is a quantum mechanics problem. Uh, here, uh, we start from a uh, Hamiltonian for a harmonic oscillator. So uh, now we, eat, we, we uh, hear the os oscillating frequency is dependent on time. Okay, this is a time dependent os oscillating harmonic oscillator. So if you look at uh, uh, this Ham Hamiltonian carefully, you can find that this Hamiltonian is actually uh, generated by uh, uh, SL2R algebra. There are three generators which span this SL2R algebra. Okay, and uh, how do we study this problem? Uh, the, the one simple way is to study the operator evolution. What I mean by operator evolution is- Sorry, what do you mean when you say it is an SL2R? What's the SL2R? Oh, SL2R means that we can write down three generators. There can I know what the group SL2R is. What is it in this problem? What is, uh, what, what is it in the context of this problem? Oh, very good. So, I mean, because now the Hamiltonian uh, is time dependent. Okay. Uh, so you can find that, um, this Hamiltonian is generated by uh, three, uh, three generators. Uh, that we, for example, we can write down there is uh, T1 equals uh, P square plus X square. T2 is uh, P square minus X square. And G3 is like PX uh, plus XP. So this Hamiltonian at a different time, they don't commute, but uh, they are generated by the three generators. Then the three generators span the SL2R algebra. Uh, are you saying that the Casimir of SL2R is the Hamiltonian? No, I don't think he's saying that. that that's what I was asking. Yeah. Uh, the Hamiltonian is a linear combination. It's a linear combination of the three generators. Ah, okay. combination of these three yes, yes. And the Hamiltonian exactly is a uh, linear combination of the three generators. Oh, sorry, I, I forgot some coefficient. coefficient. Okay, uh, this is what I mean by uh, uh, SL2R algebra. So uh, when we study the operator evolution uh, in the uh, phase space, uh, we can find that the moment, the X and the P will evolve in time, will evolve in time uh, in this phase space. Uh, it is determined by a two by two matrix, which is uh, SL2R, SL2R matrix. So, uh, so in this problem, we can tune the driving frequency omega here. We can also tune the, the driving amplitude h here. As we tune these parameters, we can find uh, this operator evolution uh, have, two can have two different uh, behaviors. Is that formula for omega of t supposed to be a model for a real swing? How did you cook up this formula for omega of t? Why, why oh. are you considering that particular formula? Oh, okay. Uh, for example, if uh, if this one is constant, it is uh, it, it simply means the harmonic oscillator has a, a fixed frequency. But now, uh, as we deform our uh, center of mass, deform our center of mass, uh, this omega uh, we depend on time. Well, it depends on time, but why that particular time dependence? Oh, this one, I mean, imagine we can tune our center of mass in, in, in this 
uh, in this way. Sure, you can tune your center of mass in some other uh, time dependent way. Uh, yeah. I have a question. So it seems like you have omega t, and the right side also has an omega t. Like the h cos omega t is is this some sort of like recursive definition? Like what is the omega in there? Is it omega naught or is it omega of t? Oh, uh, this is some other constant. The omega naught. This is some constant here. This omega. I think he's worried that that omega is the same as the symbol. Oh, sorry, 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 my bad. Uh, this we, we yeah we let me write this omega as omega one. Okay. okay. No. So there's two like three couplings there, like three parameters. Oh no no no! There are only two parameters, h and uh, this omega one. I see. Okay. And only two parameters. So this is why later I will show a this diagram. We can only tune. Okay. okay. Omega one and h. Okay. Yeah. So uh, depending on the two parameters here, uh, the operator evolution can have two uh, uh, different behaviors. In one case, uh, the uh, operator evolution will simply oscillate along a circle. And uh, the total energy, x squared plus p squared, doesn't grow. So However, we're now drawing classical pictures, right? You're using a quantum language, but those are classical trajectories. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is the, the, the yeah, uh, operator in Heisenberg uh, picture. Yeah. And uh, as we tune some other parameters, h and omega, uh, X and P can uh, they can flow to infinity. If you check the energy, it will grow in time. So this is what we mean by uh, stable and unstable. Okay. What do you mean by the energy? Oh, uh, here by energy, I simply uh, define it uh, as uh, X squared plus P squared as a function of uh, time. This is the wave function. So we, we, we define the quantity as a total energy as a function of uh, time. There's no real dis there's no dissipation in the system. Huh? There's no dissipation in the system. And no dissipation, yeah, yeah. Here I didn't introduce any dissipation. But right. also no real notion of energy. Yeah, there's no conserved energy. Yeah, yeah no conserved energy. Exactly. There is discrete time translation invariant, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, here I can we, we can choose some continuous time. Uh, that's all. I mean, I think Son means that the in, you have an omega. The, the time dependence is periodic, so there's some quasi energy. Oh, two uh, two pi over over yeah. omega is uh, time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but uh, but here what I mean by uh, energy growth is, is simply this. If the uh, driving frequency is independent of time, it, it has well defined uh, energy uh, in this way. Now we simply uh, make this driving frequency and time dependent. We, we study the same quantity uh, in time and say if this energy grows uh, in time or not. Yeah. So based on this operator evolution, we can have two different phases. One is stable and the other is unstable. Okay, this is simply some picture, a uh, very simple picture on, on uh, play, how to play swing. Okay, but uh, uh, the topic today is uh, we want to study the uh, one dimensional uh, uh, CFT. Okay, but the question is how to uh, play swing in the uh, one dimensional CFT. So imagine that uh, at the very beginning, we are given a one dimensional system where the Hamiltonian density, the Hamiltonian density is homogeneous, is homogeneous in space. Okay, uh, we have a, for example, here the lattice model, uh, the, there is a translation environment in, in space. Okay, now uh, to play swing in the second step, we will uh, deform the system uh, inhomogeneously in space. What does this mean? This means, uh, in the, we can write down a new Hamiltonian, uh, which we call H1. In this new Hamiltonian, we tune the Hamiltonian density as a function of a space. Okay, if you compare the two Hamiltonian, uh, H0 and H1, for H1, we simply modify the Hamiltonian density by a function, a real, real function, Fx. 
So which is a detected here. We, we, we tune the Hamiltonian density in space. So this step is to uh, mimic our deformation of body in pumping um, uh, a swing. Okay, that's it. This is essentially the, the setup. Uh, next, we will do the driving. What we mean by drive the system uh, periodically in time is this. We will uh, imagine we start from some uh, initial state. Then we, uh, we will uh, use Hamiltonian H1 uh, for, for some time evolution. And then we switch Hamiltonian H1 to H0 for another uh, finite time. Then we repeat this procedure uh, in time. Okay, this is, is what, what we mean by, by drive the system periodically in time. Okay, but uh, the question is how is this setup related to swing? Okay, the, uh, we can understand this relation uh, in the following slide. So, so first uh, we want to emphasize when we deform the Hamiltonian density, uh, then we can have some uh, Fourier component of the deformation. For example, uh, here uh, Tx, T is the stress tensor uh, in a, a conformal theory. If you look at the Fourier component of the deformation, we will have, uh, we define some operator which we call Ln. So these operators are nothing, uh, these operators generate nothing but the, the Verisora. Verisora algebra in one dimensional CFT. The, the, these operators satisfy the uh, communication relation here. Uh, this is a well known uh, Verisora algebra. Okay, this, th there are infinitely many generators in this Verisora algebra. However, there is, within this Verisora algebra, there is some finite dimensional uh, the SL2R algebra, uh, which are generated by three generators, L0, Ln, and L minus N. Within this uh, very big algebra, there's a small and finite uh, algebra, which is SL2R algebra. So the question is how to uh, realize uh, these three uh, generators in, in our setup. Uh, it's very easy. We can simply deform our Hamiltonian density by this uh, function. So there's a cosine uh, two pi n x over L. Here n is some integer and A, B, C are some uh, random uh, arbitrary uh, constant. So if we deform our uh, 1D system. So if n is not equal to one, is it still SL to R? Uh, yes, yes. If n is not equal to one, maybe you, you, you will ask there are, there are some constant here, right? Yeah. 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 So, but uh, now if there are only L zero and L plus minus one, there are only these three generators involved in this question, you can uh, shift, shift by a uh, shift to the L n and minus n by some constant. So this, this piece will vanish. I mean, it is still SL2R algebra. Yeah. It looks like you shifted by a trace though, which would make it not traceless anymore. SL2R is traceless, right? I mean, you can still by re redefining your L uh, zero and L plus minus n, so they will satisfy. Uh, I mean, the L zero. L zero is all always there. L zero by a constant. Uh, shift L n or L zero. I, I forgot, but uh, I mean, there, this is only some constant term, right? So maybe L zero. L zero. Yeah. I think it's not a shift L zero because if you put L n and L minus n here, uh, this term doesn't vanish, right? Uh, you get L zero on the right side. Can you do that? You can't remove the central term with a shift. Sorry? No, you might be able to remove it if you delete all the other charges other than L plus or minus n. Uh, isn't the problem that L plus n commuted with L minus n will always give you the central term? Yeah, it doesn't matter what you add to the L. Plus L zero, right? So like it, the, the, the idea is to redefine L zero so that mm -hmm. that central term is absorbed into L zero. Oh, you say, oh, I see, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if yeah, okay. at the same time, if there are 
other L M L minus M, then we cannot do this. But uh, yeah. if we the whole driving process, these are the only three generators. You can you can redefine them by shifting a cost constant. This is okay. But if at the same time, if you have other L M L K, you cannot do this. You can use the, use the you cannot always uh yeah yeah it's not closed uh, so it's closed. Like, yeah. I guess the same is for SL two R there is no central extension. Yeah. yeah, and that's what you restricted. Yeah, so what I mean here by SL two R is up up to this uh, constant up to this uh, constant you can absorb it by redefining. Generator. Okay. Uh, once we do this, now uh, we have the SL two R algebra. Uh, it has the same algebra as the swing, right? Then we expect that there can be a uh, uh, two different phase uh, phases in this uh, driving problem. Okay. Okay. So how how do we study this problem? So usually when we calculate the non non equilibrium time evolution. We are interested in the uh, correlation function, uh, multi-point correlation function. Again, here this um, O1, O2, uh, these, uh, these, they are defined uh, in this uh, Heisenberg picture. Here, U, U, T, and U dagger are the unitary uh, time evolution operator, uh, which correspond to the driving. Okay, so, so roughly speaking, these operators, as we drive this operator, as we drive the system, these operators will evolve in the two-dimensional space-time. Now we will study how these operators evolve on the two-dimensional two space-time. Uh, to give a very concrete example, imagine we start the uh, driving from the ground state, ground state of the undeformed Hamiltonian. Okay. Okay. Then the, uh, the relevant uh, uh, path integral is, is as follows. Uh, if the initial state is a ground state of the undeformed Hamiltonian, uh, the total system is of less L. Okay, this is uh, in this W plane. We have space in this direction and imaginary time in this direction. It goes from minus infinity to positive infinity. So when we study this operator, this operator evolution is convenient to uh, first do a conformal mapping uh, by mapping this uh, W plane to some uh, B plane. Uh, map this plane to some n layer, n layer, n layer uh, manifold. Okay, then for this SL2, uh, SL2 uh, deformed Hamiltonian, what we found is uh, very simple. The operator, as we drive the system, this operator will simply uh, move along a circle. Uh, I mean, the circle, if you look at only at one layer, one layer, it's a circle, this trajectory is a circle. So this operator will evolve from the, uh, the old coordinate ZZ bar to some new coordinate Z nu and ZZ nu bar. So this operator evolution is determined, I mean, Z nu here, the new location here, is related to the old location by a two by two matrix. Uh, this is called the Mobius transformation. So this two by two matrix is a SU one comma one matrix. It is isomorphic uh, to uh, SL two R matrix. So is, your system doesn't preserve conformal symmetry anymore, right? What, why are we doing this fancy conformal transformation? Oh, the, uh, actually, you can consider this problem as a, a CFT uh, with uh, on curve the uh, space time metric. We simply change the metric actually. We change the metric. Yeah, yeah it's all, always a CFT actually. Yeah, but with the curve the space time. Yeah, this is why we can study this problem within the CFT uh, uh, framework. If we, if the system is no longer a CFT, I don't know how, how to study. But you have some exponentiated operator that, that is exactly that has some exactly scales and things in it, right? So wh why do you still have conformal symmetry? Oh, the, okay. The, the question is very simple. So if you have an operator O, 
So the unitary uh, time evolution is something like, for example, E2 uh, minus, right? This is L0 plus Ln and plus L minus N. There is some coefficient. coefficient. So there's some time dependent and position dependent. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. So basically, the, the time evolution is unitary operator here. You know, we always have some uh, the Virasora generator. Uh, then we have, uh, there's a good dagger here. We simply need to figure out how this operator evolve under this unitary time evolution. Yeah, this is. Uh, no, but it's not just e to the t there, right? It, isn't it a isn't it a function that turns on and off in t? Yeah, yeah. So this is a very yeah yeah. This is not the exact. Uh, I mean, it's a function, some function uh, of t, but uh, and the, not even a smooth function. The, not a, there's a two step. There's a, a step function. Yeah. So, but roughly this part is the, the most important. Okay, so the setup is, is, is very simple. Okay, uh, yeah, as, as Kali mentioned, so when you drive the system for a single step, it is described by a single two by two matrix. Now, if you drive the system uh, by a multi n step, we will have a multi multiplication of n two by two matrix. So this uh, this relation determines how the operator evolves in time. So we can have, yeah, and the product of a matrix. So, so this is a non-equilibrium uh, uh, problem, but essentially we are actually performing the conformal transformation uh, in time. That, that's why the, the, the problem can be uh, analytically solved. Okay. Then you may want to ask, okay, uh, what is the phase diagram? How do we under the phase diagram uh, in parallel with the swing, the swing problem, right? Okay, the, uh, the phase diagram can be determined in a very, very simple way. We simply, as we drive the system with uh, n, the product of n two by two matrix, we simply need to study uh, the trace, the absolute value, value of this, a trace of this uh, a product of a two by two matrix. Uh, de uh, depending on uh, this value is uh, smaller or bigger than two, we can have uh, two different phase. Uh, we can have one heating phase and one non heating phase with some phase transition. Uh, let, let me give more detail uh, as follows. So, so the meaning of this uh, phase diagram is determined by the operator evolution by the operator evolution. For example, uh, if we are in this non-heating phase, then the operator evolution will be determined by some uh, elliptic Mobius transformation. The operator will simply oscillate, oscillate along a circle. So everything will oscillate along a circle. Then this means the system uh, can repeat, uh, can go back to its initial state. This means the system is stable. Uh, this is similar to the swing, uh, the energy uh, the operator simply oscillate along a circle. However, in this heating phase, in this heating phase, the operator will no longer oscillate along the circle. It will flow from some unstable fixed point to some stable uh, fixed point. It will never come back to its initial location. This means the system can never go back to the initial condition. This means something uh, interesting may happen. And in between the two uh, behaviors, there's a parabolic uh, feature of the operator evolution. The operator, there's a single fixed point. It is uh, not stable and not, I mean, it's a, like uh, the operator can flow from this side and back to, to, to this uh, the, the single fixed point. Okay, this is simply some uh, uh, um, mathematical picture, but what, have, what are the physical features uh, in different phases? Let me give you a very concrete uh, example. So here we consider um, two Hamiltonians, H0, which is uh, uh, a uniform Hamiltonian, and another Hamiltonian, H1, 
which is we, we simply deform the Hamiltonian density by a cosine function with a wavelength a small l. Uh, the capital L is the total wave, total length of the one D system. So there are uh, an in, integer number of the, the wavelengths uh, within the, uh, the deformation. So, okay, that's it. Now when we drive the system, uh, the only parameters we can tune are the time T1 and the T0. Okay, T1 and the T0. Then, okay, now what we can plot um, you know, we, we, have, we can change the time T1 here and the T0 here. We can get some phase diagram. This phase diagram is simply, de is simply determined by the operator evolution I introduced in the previous slide. Okay, we found some uh, two different phase. In this non-heating phase, nothing is uh, interesting. Everything will oscillate in time. But in this heating phase, in this heating phase, if you study the energy density evolution, so what I show here, uh, this direction is a space direction, and this direction is a driving uh, the, the number. Of, so here n is a number of driving. We drive the system with one step, two step, three step, and so on. As we drive the system in time, we can find the energy density will be accumulated at some very special point. Okay, uh, the, so the location of this uh, peak is determined by the operator evolution by the fixed point uh, I, I introduced in the previous slide. This is some uh, conformal field theory calculation, and we also do the simulation uh, lattice model. This is the lattice free, free Fermi lattice model. Uh, you can find the, uh, the agree uh, very well. So this is some uh, feature in this uh, heating, heating phase where the, the energy, the total energy of the system will grow, will grow in time. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, here uh, the location of the energy density peak is determined by the, the, the location of the fixed point in the operator evolution. And uh, later uh, in another work, uh, sorry, can, can you just elaborate on that? Uh -huh. point. So we have some SL2R matrix, which is classified into one of those types. Yes. And how is the how is that classification into types telling you which point in space? Oh, uh, very good. So, okay. For example, here uh, in this uh, in this plot, I you can find that there are four four peaks, right? This is because uh, in the deformation, I choose two wavelengths, two wavelengths in the deformation. Okay. Then uh, for two wavelengths. If sorry, you, in which from in, in the in the exponents there? Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, when I write down the Hamiltonian H one, we we deform the the system by some function. Uh -huh. Yeah, this is the to, the total system is a capital L. Uh, the wavelength of the deformation is a small l. Uh -huh. In this calculation, we choose a uh, two uh, wavelengths in the deformation. Uh -huh. This is why we have uh, four uh, energy because one uh, two are uh, chiral density energy peak, and the other two are anti chiral energy density peaks. If you deform the system by uh, an arbitrary number n wavelengths, you will have a 2n energy density peak. The 2n energy density peak. So the location, the location of this uh, peak is determined by uh, the, the, the fixed point, uh, the fixed point in the operator evolution. So I just, I just got myself confused. Which which two D CFT were you were you computing it? For oh yeah, yeah. This is for arbitrary two D CFT. Okay, so it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Yeah, this is well, why I'm using it. the operator spectrum, which just uses the SL two R eigenvalues of that right. of that matrix. Yeah. But when you're saying exact calculation of the field theory, it should, so the details made no difference. It made no difference. You just needed conformal solution. Yeah, yeah. The only thing we need is the Virasara algebra. So we, we don't use any other kind of thing. Yeah, but uh, in this concrete calculation, we sure we use the free Fermi in CFT, right? <laughs> because we need to compare it with the free Fermi lattice calculation. But uh, uh, the, the whole story is independent of what kind of CFT you consider. Yeah. Yeah, this is uh, my motivation for this slide. For this slide, uh, uh, another group, uh, they, they, they use a, a very different model uh, called the XXD model. This is uh, 
uh, compact free boson CFT. They, uh, they compare their numerical result and the CFT calculation. Yeah, they found that also the very good agreement. Yeah, it's not a very good <laughs> agreement because their lattice size is very small. It's like 80, 80 spins. Yeah. But uh, my point is that the, the result is uh, really independent of the concrete, concrete lattice model and CFT. <laughs> Okay, just just to check again, the, the choice of little n in your in your um, perturbation is affecting which aspect again of the oh very, very good the n so so for if you have a system of total length capital L you can deform your system by a wavelength small l uh, my definition of n is capital L or small l that's it yeah here you can only observe two peaks because they choose n equals one. Yeah, the calculation. Yeah, this is a feature of the energy density, energy density evolution. So uh, we are also interested in the quantum entanglement uh, evolution. For example, we want to ask if you study the entanglement between the left half and the right half, uh, what is the uh, uh, entanglement? Okay, we, we use the entanglement entropy. Uh, what we found is a very uh, interesting. In this non-heating phase, the entanglement entropy for the half system simply oscillates in time. Okay, this is as expected uh, because the operator simply oscillates in time. However, if we are in the heating phase, the entanglement entropy will grow, grow linearly in time. And uh, at the phase transition here, at the phase transition here, the entanglement entropy will grow at the log t. Okay, and the coefficient of this log t is uh, central charge over three. Okay. Uh, all these dependence, you mean a coefficient in front of log l, or for what? Uh, oh, so, so the scaling of should be a log, right? You mean with this one? Well, I mean, the uh, entanglement entropy, the quantity. Oh, yeah, 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 I totally agree. Yeah, what I mean is this. When, uh, for, this is a finite system. If you study the entanglement entropy in the ground state, it grows at a uh, log L of the yeah. subsystem size. But uh, the, now we are interested in the time evolution based on this value. Uh -huh. You have a log L at the very beginning, yeah. but uh, as you drive the system, it will grow the linearly. I see. Now we already removed the, 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 the initial log L then. Based on yeah, based on this, it will grow the, it will grow linearly in time. I see. So it's, it's kind of a, a coefficient at least dependence and time central charge and oh no 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 it, it is uh, the initial is log L plus uh, some uh, linear growth. A linear growth of time. Oh, I see. Yeah. You mean, I see. The sub leading term has dependence, but the leading term is independent of the driving. Yeah, yeah. This is a leading term in a long time uh, driving limit. Right? This is your initial I initial okay. entanglement. It's, it's, is alpha necessarily independent of the length? Oh, of this alpha, alpha is, uh, it depends on your uh, driving Hamiltonian, it's zero, it's one. And also your time t zero t one. Right, right, but but does it depend on L the the, the system size? Uh, it doesn't reach It size. doesn't depend. Ah, okay. Yeah. yeah, It only depends on the driving. I see. Yeah. So 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 here you have the it's, you turned on and turned off with a step function. Yeah. If you smooth it, would it would it matter much? It doesn't matter. Uh, uh yeah yeah another uh. Group they study this uh, smooth deformation. Mm -hmm. they, they found the same as feature. What is this omega in the non heating phase? Oh, you mean this omega, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, this omega is very, very interesting. For example, when you drive the system, uh, when you drive the system very, very quickly, in the, which means that you are in the high, uh, high frequency limit, this omega is independent of your. T0 and T1. It only depends on your deformation length, actually. This is something interesting. You mean like it depends on N, or but it doesn't depend on? Uh, uh, this omega will only depend on this wavelength uh -huh. deformation. 
it is independent of your how how, how quickly or how slowly you, you drive your, your, your system. It's one of the eigenvalues of the elliptic matrix. Eigenvalue. Uh, I, I don't I'm, I, I don't remember how it's related to the eigenvalue. It's, it's sure they, they are related, but uh, I'm not sure it's exactly the, the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, because you know everything is determined by the operator evolution. So that's two by two matrix contain all the information in this time uh, time evolution. Yeah. Okay. Uh, before I, I uh, move forward, there's one interesting thing I want to uh, emphasize. So, so in equilibrium physics, we are interested in the uh, universality class. Uh, how the feature behave as we go uh, as we are close to the phase transition here what we find as we for example here as we cross this phase transition uh, we can study how this uh, linear growth the, the behaves and how the oscillation how the oscillation uh, period uh, change as we uh, we are close to the phase transition what we found is very interesting um, if we go from the heating phase to the phase transition, we change the parameter uh, T uh, close to this T star. T star is where a phase transition happens. So the rate of the linear growth will, uh, depending on this uh, external parameter, you know, scaling behavior in this way. Similarly, if we go from the non heating phase to the phase transition, the oscillating period will diverge diverge uh, in this way. So the, yeah, the exponents here are really independent of the, what, ki what kind of a CFT we are considering. So it's super, some super uh, universal feature for the uh, critical exponents. Um, yeah, this is simply some ob observation. Mm -hmm. Oh, I found I'm moving very slowly. Uh, Okay. Uh, yeah, one more feature I want to emphasize. So why, you may want to ask why uh, the entanglement entropy grows linearly in the heating phase? There is a, actually a very uh, intuitive picture. So as we drive the system in the heating phase, first uh, there will be some energy density peaks as we uh, introduced just now. So in this process, uh, as we mentioned, there are stable fixed point and unstable fixed point. For this unstable fixed point, uh, some EPR pairs uh, will be split, will be split with one member uh, moving to the left peak and the other member moving to the right peak. These two peaks are entangled with each other and uh, this entanglement grow, grow linearly in time. So this means as we drive the system, we are actually pumping some entangled pairs and split them to different locations in space. So yeah, we, we call it something like an entanglement pump. But uh, this is some intuitive picture uh, for the linear growth of entanglement entropy. So later we, we study this uh, driving, periodical driving. We also study random driving and also in some quasi-periodical driving. Uh, yeah, this problem can be mapped to some um, uh, crystal, quasi-crystal and Anderson localization. Um, well, it's in our solid state of physics, there, there is some mapping. Uh, yeah. Okay, I will go. I will move quickly to, to the to the uh, cooling cooling part. So yes, yeah, just now we have introduced the, the uh, basic setup of the, of the flow pet CFT. We want to use this setup uh, as a cooling. So what do we mean is this: if your system is initially prepared at a finite temperature. So there is both a quantum entanglement and also the, the thermal, uh, uh, the classical correlation. So when we drive the system uh, in the heating phase, what we found is that um, the thermal entropy, for example, the thermal entropy uh, here can be pumped to the, to the energy density peaks. So if you look at the region, here, you can find the temperature uh, will go from finite temperature to zero temperature exponentially fast in time. So we will show, we will give, 
give you some details for, for this cooling process. Isn't temperature kind of an equilibrium notion? What, what are we exactly talking about here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will, I, uh, exactly. So in the next two, two slides, I will introduce what do I mean by, by studying the, the, the temperature in this region. After two slides, I can, I can answer your question. So uh, before, I, uh, uh, before I go into the next slide, I, I will mention some similar idea uh, were recently considered in, in some, uh, new, some other system in, in some gapped uh, um, cold atom system, uh, but in a single quantum quench. It's also considered in some uh, moving mirror problem. Uh, the setup are different, but the idea is quite uh, related. So roughly we are moving the thermal entropy from one place to the other place. So then, we can use this to realize the cooling. Okay, uh, let, let me go, go, go to the concrete, uh, concrete uh, setup. So basically, the system is initially prepared uh, at some finite temperature, which is the thermal state. There's the inverse temperature beta here. And when we do the driving, we, we introduce some uh, finite wavelength. So in this problem, okay, uh, I want to mention here, we consider an infinite, infinite long uh, 1D system. So the finite temperature beta and the wavelength L, they are the only two length scales in this problem. Okay, we consider an infinite long uh, system. Okay, now if you study the, the energy density, now let's study the energy density uh, in this uh, region between, between the two energy density peaks. Before we drive the system, okay, the energy density is it depends on the temperature, right? This is the well-known result. It, it, it is proportional to T squared. T is the temp temperature. Now, as we drive the system, we can find the this energy density will de de decrease to the Casimir ground state value. So this is uh, some um, negative value. So in this plot, uh, the red dot dashed line is the CFT calculation. We also do the lattice simulation, which is some green line. Uh, maybe you cannot see it clearly. They agree very well. So we can say the energy density goes from the thermal value to the ground state uh, Casimir value uh, in time. So, so it, it de decreases. Sorry, I'm confused. That, that's, what do you mean when you say that's the ground state value? I thought the, the Casimir energy was for, that you're talking about that, that refers to was for a system on a circle. Oh, very, very good. So, again, okay. very good question. So, what I mean, why? Yeah, okay. The setup is that we consider an infinitely uh, yeah. a long system. But this value, this value is the ground state of value of the CFT on a circle of length small l. Right. Yeah. So why did we get that? Yeah, this is simply why do we get this is a cool okay. Let, let me make it clear what I mean by why did you call it the Casimir energy? Casimir energy means finite spatial size. Yeah, right. So yeah. So so my, my claim is very simple. Um when we do this cooling. The, the final uh, wave function or the final uh, physical observables are the same as the observables uh, at, for a finite CFT of length L at zero temperature. Yeah, I will, I will tell you more detail in, in the later when we study the reduced density matrix. So your initial state L is the distance between the two spikes. Yeah, yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, this is some very interesting feature. The cooling is not cooling down to the ground state of an infinite system, but it, it is cooling down to the ground state of a finite CFT, uh, I mean, or circle L. This L is the, 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 exactly the distance between the two peaks. Is there any communication between the, the regions separated by an intermediate spike? Oh, very good question. I currently I don't know the answer. And it's uh, you need you need to study the mutual information yeah. and this region, this region, right? Uh, I we haven't uh, done this calculation. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I don't know the answer. This is a, yeah, my collaborator also asked me this question, but uh, we don't see the answer now. Okay, uh, we, we can see the cooling effect in this region, but uh, the total energy of the system uh, still grows in time. This is like, uh, you, you know, in our refrigerator, inside of the refrigerator, is, it, the temperature is low, but as a whole, we are because we are inputting power, right? So the, the whole room is, is the, the energy is growing. So sim it's similar here. Although this region is cooling down to some uh, ground state uh, value, but the total system is absorbing energy uh, exponentially fast in time. Okay, uh, this is energy. Similarly, if you study the entangle, uh, the volume entropy, the volume entropy in this subsystem, uh, here we have three different lines. Uh, because that we can there are three different initial temperature, three different initial temperature. As we drive the system in time, no matter what is your initial temperature, finally the volume entropy in the cooling region will decrease to the ground state value, ground state value of a CFT, again on a circle of length L. A circle of length L. Okay. And uh, yeah, this is what happened in this cooling region. If you study the volume entropy in the heating region, uh, it will grow the linearly, linearly uh, in time. Okay, till now, I simply show you some uh, concrete uh, uh, quantity, the energy, the entropy. Okay, to, 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 to convince ourselves um, more completely, so we study the reduced density matrix. So the whole information of the subsystem A is uh, contained in this reduced density matrix rho A, okay? So we know that the uh, reduced density matrix can, can be um, equivalently uh, expressed as the entanglement Hamiltonian. Entanglement Hamiltonian is defined as a minus log of a reduced density matrix. So in conformal field theory, a nice property is, is this. Uh, this entanglement Hamiltonian is simply um, a function of the local uh, physical Hamiltonian density with some uh, uh, modification, which we call it a, a local temperature. As we drive the system, at the very beginning, uh, the, the reduced density matrix is nothing but a ther the thermal density matrix. It, it depends only depends on the temp temperature beta, temperature beta. As we drive the system in time, so this, this local temperature here will, will evolve in this way. Finally, it will approach to this ground state, ground state, um, ground state value. So what I mean is very simple. If you study the reduced density matrix for your cooling region, it will evolve from a thermal value to some ground state uh, reduced density matrix. So this is, this is how we define temperature. You simply uh, study everything in your uh, reduced density matrix and study how your entanglement Hamiltonian evolve in time. We find that the entanglement Hamiltonian will evolve from a thermal one to the a zero temperature, zero temperature one. This is how we define the temperature, we, we define it through the reduced density matrix. Okay, once we, we, we have this result, now we are uh, confident. Indeed, we are realizing, yeah, yeah. Oh. Is there a reason why at like intermediate time steps, the evolution is not, is, is sort of a chiral? Oh, very good, very, it's not a symmetric, right? You see, because we only plot the chiral part. Oh, right? I see, I see. And the anti-chiral part, we, 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 we haven't, if we consider both, it will be the same magic. Yeah, that's a very good observation. Yeah. Okay. So this is a, the, the feature of the entanglement Hamiltonian in the cooling region. I think maybe you, you want to ask what happened if we study the reduced density matrix for this heating region. So we also calculated the, the, the entanglement Hamiltonian. What we found is it, it is quite different from the cooling region. We can find that there are some uh, dips. Uh, so this location, 
correspond to the location of the energy density peak. So if this value is smaller and smaller, this means the effective temperature here is higher and higher. Why the temperature here is higher and higher? Because as we drive the system, this peak is highly entangled with the neighboring peak. This, this super high temperature is, is because of this uh, increasing entanglement between the two, two peaks. This is why we see some uh, dips here in this heating region. Okay, this is simply the, the conformal field theory result. We want to compare it with the lattice model calculation. Again, but in, in lattice model calculation, it's, it's very hard to calculate the entanglement Hamiltonian directly because you, you need really high precision of your computer. Uh, uh, but uh, here we compare the entanglement spectrum, which, which is the spectrum of the entanglement Hamiltonian. In particular, only the, the low energy part of this uh, entanglement spectrum is important for the entanglement property. So on the right, we, we compare uh, the, 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 the red dashed line is the CFT result for the entanglement spectrum in the cooling region and the heating region. And the, the green dots are the lattice, lattice result. We, we compare the, the field theory and the lattice calculation. They really agree with each other. Okay, so, so that's it. So uh, let, let me uh, give a summary of the, of the slide here. So we start from a very simple time-dependent driving of the CFT. We can solve this problem. Uh, there can be two different phases de depending on your driving. In particular, in this heating phase, uh, we can apply uh, it to the system, which is initially prepared at finite temperature. It can realize the conformal cooling. Um, there is some cooling region where the effective temperature uh, can be uh, decreased to the zero temperature exponentially fast. So the whole dynamics can be uh, solved analytically. Uh, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for your attention. Yeah. Yeah. So um, if I understood correctly, you have a particular solvable model where you can get this kind of phase diagram and this heating and non-heating regions. If How stable is it? Like if you, I don't know, somehow perturb it a little bit, the type of- Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to say this, this uh, heating phase is not as stable um, in the following sense. Uh, for example, here we have a, uh, if you break the integrability of the CFT, sure, <laughs> this will vanish. But even, even if you preserve the uh, integrability property, for example, here, if you introduce some noise in this driving, you, here, we, we, uh, you, we use Hamiltonian H1 for T1 and Hamiltonian H0 for T0. If you introduce some small fluctuation in your time T1, T0, for example, so this heating phase will also vanish. Uh, but, uh, there is always some time scale. I mean, for your perturbation strength, uh, within this time scale, uh, it has a heating feature, but in the lo very long time uh, limit compared to the mm -hmm. uh, perturbation stress, uh, uh, this is not stable. Do you have some intuitive picture for why you get a non-heating phase in this system? Maybe, maybe you've said that. Like, what's What's special about it? Oh, what is special for the non-heating phase? Oh, there are several ways. Uh, one way is uh, if you study the operator evolution, the operator will simply oscillate in the, in the, in the, in the system. So everything will oscillate. Um, uh, you can also consider this question in the, in the Fox space. I mean, if you look at the eigen, eigenvalue and, uh, in your initial Hamiltonian, when you do this driving, uh, the, the system will simply only the very low, several, several low exciting states will be occupied and they will simply oscillate there. However, for this heating phase, uh, I mean, in the Fox space, uh, the, the, the system will evolve to higher and higher energy levels. Um, um, yeah, I'm not sure if that's a good, good understanding. Um, 
Oh, uh, yeah, maybe let, let me say it this way. So, so SL2 R group, it is a non compact group. Um, let, let me say it this way. Uh, how, how generally can we say about this phase diagram? My point is this if you give me a system, as long as there is SL2 R algebra, uh, if you are in your non equilibrium dynamics, only, if only the compact subgroup. I mean, if only the compact subgroup come in, uh, the system will be in the non heating phase because everything will oscillate. If some non compact some group comes in uh, in your time evolution, it will flow to some, uh, I mean, uh, there will be some heating phase. So, this is, I mean, this is how um, we have two different phases in the quantum mechanical problem. Uh, so I think uh, you can, in general, you can also write down some gapped system where if you have some as nice SL2R algebra, you can also do this time evolution. You can have a similar thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. This compact and non-compact non uh, thing is important here. Yeah. <clears throat> About the super universality of your critical exponents, uh, should I understand the reason that they don't depend on the specific universality classes just because the 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 driving Hamiltonian that you choose is just entirely determined by the Virasoro algebra. Yeah, yeah, I think so. So there's the 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 yeah, any specific information about the CFT does not show up in any way. Right, right. I so think. yeah, I think this is the yeah, the reason. I see. Only Virasoro algebra, which is there for arbitrary right, right. to use CFT. Yeah. Okay. The global conformal case is not interesting, presumably. N equal one. Yeah. It's the entire size of the system. Uh, for N equal to one, if you start from your uh, ground state, nothing interesting. Yeah. But uh, if you start from some excited state, uh, uh, there is an interesting thing. There is something. Okay. Yeah, there is something. Yeah. For, for N equals one, don't you still get these two energy peaks? Yeah, uh, the reason is this. You know, for N equal to one, uh, H0 and H1, they will share the same ground state. Oh, right, right, right. This is why I, I claim if you start from some excited state, which is not the eigenstate of the H1 Hamiltonian, mm -hmm. there is an interesting thing, and there are two, two peaks. Right. Yeah. So have you, have you tried extending to higher dimension? Oh, very, very good. Uh, I be, you know, in higher dimensional CMT, there are also SL2R algebra. I believe uh, the similar phase. I mean, there can still be two different phase heating and non heating. But the reason we focus on 1D is we want to solve it exactly. <laughs> we, we use the virus or carbon mapping to solve the. the yeah, but I think that if you just use the SL2R in, in higher dimensions, you could also solve it exactly. Maybe, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, 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 the point is, as long as you only use SL2R, the interesting uh, phase diagram will also appear. Mm -hmm. so, but I, I I don't know how to solve it. Yeah. Uh, let's thank the speaker again.